O Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or earth below. O Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above. O Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or earth below. O Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above. You keep your covenant of love, your covenant of love. O Lord, there is no God like you in heaven above. O Lord, God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or earth below. O Lord, God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above. You keep your covenant of love, your covenant of love. O Lord, there is no God like you in heaven above. O Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or earth below. O Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven above. Good evening, everyone. Welcome out to our Wednesday night Bible class. Happy to see you all your lovely faces. Uh, before we begin um, our Bible class this evening, we do have a quick announcement, just reminding everyone that if you have any electronic devices that will be a little bit distracting for you, we ask that you turn it off, put it on silent mode, vibrant mode, so that we can all fully engage in the word of God. Amen. Amen. With that, uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Most righteous and eternal Father, we thank you so much for just giving us this time uh, to meet together, Lord, as we continue to meet virtually uh, for our Bible class, Father God, for over a year now. Uh, we thank you so much just for this uh, outlet that we have to continue to, to gather together, to serve, uh, to um, read scripture, to, to really encourage each other, Lord God, through your word. And Lord, we don't want to take it for granted because uh, sometimes it's, it's really when we lose something that we uh, appreciate it the most. And so, Father, help us, Lord, to really have minds and hearts that are fully engaged in uh, tonight's uh, you know, Bible discussion, Father God. This I pray in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Darren. We're going to continue with our Bible class tonight. I have some announcements concerning our brethren in Venezuela. Uh, towards the end of class, before we say goodbye, uh, we are reading Second Samuel, and tonight our devotional is going to come from our brother Steve Aponte Jr. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, bro. Good evening, everyone. So, just to start with some historical background on the book of Second Samuel. So, the author of uh, this book is unknown, but believed to be written by the prophets Nathan and Gad. And as Pedro mentioned on Sunday, at one point, 1 and 2 Samuel were one book. Uh, but when the Old Testament was translated to Greek, the books were separated. And this translation is also known as the Septuagint. So the books open up, or I should say the book opens up with David finding out about Saul's death. And David's reaction is not what you may have expected from a man who was hunted for years by King Saul who was seeking after David's death because of Saul's jealousy and envy. 
David's reaction reveals his reverent fear and love for God. He hears about Saul's death through an Amalekite and is shocked to hear that the Amalekite assisted in the killing of Saul, one of God's anointed. And for that reason, the Amalekite would unfortunately suffer the same fate as Saul. It's important to note, though, that the Amalekites were a fierce enemy of Israel, born out of the tribe of Esau, and opposed Israel as they were coming out of Egypt during the Exodus. If you remember in 1 Samuel 15, the the Amalekites were the tribe that God commanded Saul to to devote to destruction. But Saul did not follow through on that command. And this was the moment where God rejected Saul as king. But jumping back to David's reaction to Saul's death, we read in the chapter, um, the first chapter of 2 Samuel, that David laments over Saul and Jonathan's death. And again, we see the heart of David in these verses as he honors the former king of Israel and his son. The main purpose of 2 Samuel was to record the reign of King David, and it places the Davidic covenant in its historical context. This covenant was God's promise to the house of David to establish a kingdom that would endure forever. It was a promise that the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come from the lineage of David and the tribe of Judah and be placed on the throne as our king forever. This promise was spoken through the prophet Nathan and recorded in detail in 2 Samuel 7. Verses 11 through 17 reads, And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you a rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. And in Luke chapter 1, when the angel appeared before Mary, the angel said to her in verse 30, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So the birth of Christ was the fulfillment of Nathan's prophecy in 2 Samuel 7. And the book of 2 Samuel can be split up into two main sections. The first section being David's triumphs, which can be seen in chapters 1 through 10, and the second being David's troubles or failures, as can be seen in chapters 11 through 20. In the early chapters, we see the evil hearts of men rise up as civil war breaks out amongst the Israelites, and the camps are divided into two groups, Judah and Israel. Not too long after, David becomes king over all of Israel and makes plans to move the country's capital from Hebron to Jerusalem. We learn a few valuable lessons from the story of Uzzah and the ark in chapter six. If you recall, the ark was being carried on a cart when one of the oxen stumbled. Uzzah reaches his hand out to secure the ark and unfortunately he dies. At first glance, this may seem like a harsh punishment, but let's take a deeper look into this situation. So mistake number one, first of all, the ark was not to be carried on a cart. If you remember in Exodus 25, verses 13 through 15, God commanded Moses by saying, 
You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. And you shall put into the ark the testimony that I shall give you. Additionally, only the Levites were allowed to carry the ark. In 2 Samuel, the Israelites got this idea of putting the ark on a cart from the Philistines. Again, if you remember in 1 Samuel 5, the Philistines captured the ark and placed it next to their god, Dagon. As a result, God punishes them and causes tumors to break out amongst the people. The Philistines quickly return the ark to Israel on a cart being pulled by oxen. And then later on in 2 Samuel 6, we see the Israelites adopting a worldly concept they received from the Philistines, ignoring God's command to Moses in Exodus on how to carry the ark. And here they are moving the ark on a cart. That was sin number one. Mistake or sin number two was Uzzah, who knew God's holy things should not be touched. This was a man who was educated on these matters, but for some reason lost sight of his reverent fear of God and touched the ark and died. So how do these lessons of carrying the ark of God apply to us today? So for one, God cares deeply about details and specifics, and he expects his people to also care deeply about them. Failing to follow God's precise instructions would be seen as one, not revering God's words spoken in the Bible. Secondly, having an independent attitude that might border rebellion, that is seeing and acting on things from a worldly point of view and not a spiritual one. And third, just straight up disobedience. For example, if God says don't use his name in vain, then don't use his name in vain. Don't be like Uzzah. Secondly, don't get too comfortable like Uzzah did. Uzzah, who knew God's ark was holy and not to be touched, got too comfortable with who he was and the job given to him. He took it upon himself to play the role of God by preventing the ark from falling, as if God wasn't able to take care of that himself. So oftentimes we try to play the role of God. Perhaps in the past you thought to yourself, is Sunday really that important? Or maybe you didn't think it or say it. But your actions, like Uzzah's, have, sh you know, have shown an irreverent fear of God by disregarding Sunday as if it were like any other day. Treating God as if he were some friend of yours who you can take lightly and think, eh, it's not that big of a deal. What's one Sunday? Don't play the role of God. It will not end well. Lastly, sin and making foolish decisions doesn't just affect one person. Uzzah wasn't the original offender. It was David. David knew the ark was to be carried by the Levites on poles, and yet he chose for his men to push it on a cart. This mistake led to Uzzah's mistake, which led to Uzzah's death. We see in that same chapter that David was angry that the Lord struck Uzzah. David's anger was most likely a result of his poor decision-making. He could have pre prevented this horrible outcome. So think about the decisions you make in your life because it will not only affect you, but also those whom you love. As we go deeper into 2 Samuel, we start to see the troubles of King David. His terrible decision-making comes into full view when he lusts after Bathsheba in chapter 11. A great lesson for all of us to guard our hearts above all else, as it says in Proverbs 4.23. But thank God for his mercy. David wholeheartedly confesses and repents before God, and God graciously forgives him. However, he also tells David that as a result of his sin, trouble would arise within his household, and surely it did. Later on, David's son Absalom, who he loved dearly, would lead a rebellion against David and force David out of his own kingdom. And in chapter 18, as Absalom was in pursuit of David, he got stuck in a tree and was killed by Joab and his army, despite David giving orders to all of his men not to harm Absalom. You can hear David's tears of grief as you read 2 Samuel 18, 33. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, but I had died instead of you. 
O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. There are many lessons to be learned from King David, but one that stands out to me is how our sin and poor decision-making can affect so many people around us, especially our loved ones, and for generations to come. Something that may seem so simple or not that big of a deal to you can cause a lot of pain for someone who loves you. So I hope and pray that all of us can learn from David and be all the more wiser as we live out our lives here on earth.